Good morning. I welcome you all this morning, and I especially welcome uh, Caden Daniel Kleck, who's going to receive the sacrament of holy baptism today. And we welcome him into the Lord's family, and we welcome uh, all of our all of his guests and family. Um, we're glad that you're with us today. Um, please know that uh, everything you need for the service will be up on the screen, and we invite you to participate. Uh, we also invite you to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion if you would like to. We believe that Christ is present in the meal for our forgiveness, life, and salvation. And um, you, if you commune anywhere, uh, you are welcome to commune with us today. And I'll give further instructions um, closer to communion on how to do that. But just please know that you're invited and welcomed. A uh, couple of other quick announcements. Um, Saturday, May 20th, we're doing a spring cleanup day. Um, we love hands of every size and age to help us with that. Um, we have Vacation Bible School uh, posted for July, um, the second week of July, and that's for kids age uh, three through sixth grade. Um, and you can sign up any time now. And um, we have a special presentation today. She's giving you clues. <laughs> Good morning, potential Lutheran camp supporters. I am Phyllis Givens, congregation member and person voted most likely to be Berkeley Hills Lutheran campaign leader, and I even have the hat to prove it. Raise your hand if you have some familiarity with Lutheran. Okay, and for those of you who do not, um, it is a 660-acre ELCA camp facility, um, open year-round, located about 40 miles north of Pittsburgh between Butler and Prospect. It has just about any kind of program uh, or activity you would expect at a camp, plus very creative outdoor worship. Luther Lynn is running a capital campaign asking all the Lutheran churches in North and Southwestern Pennsylvania to raise funds to one, rebuild their amphitheater, which is where they have their outdoor worship, and two, to build five new cabins. The amphitheater is the camp's worship area, and it has wood railings and seats, think splinters, and sinking into the ground, and uh, the walkways are brick laid on sand, which has become even over time, and the amphitheater has been there for well over 50 years. Um, the other project that will be undertaken is five new cabins. The old cabins were built 65 years ago. I went to a Boy Scout family camp once, and we had boxcars with the big sliding doors and really friendly daddy long legs. So these are a were a, a tiny bit like that, and their, their time is done. The new cabins will have upgraded facilities. They're going to be located in a much more convenient area to the rest of the facilities, and uh, the building materials will be much safer. We'll have a five-week campaign, and we'll conclude the first week in June, and you can pledge. Oh, look, I have a pledge card. You can pledge for a one-time donation, or do it over three years. Say you want to give $5 a year, $50 a year, um, to the end of three years. Um, you can go to an online link at our weekly church bulletin that is in there. You can just donate directly. Be sure you tell them you're from Berkeley Hills. Um, and then you can also do it with the pledge card, and there'll be envelopes for that that you can give to either myself on Sunday or turn it into the church office. And then uh, the, end, the end of that uh, campaign in the first weekend of June, we'll tally it all up and send it off to Lutherland. Uh, there'll be a, a film of Lutherland very short running in the screen in the Narfex, the whole month of May. If you miss it this Sunday, you can get it again next Sunday. Um, what else? Oh, 
After service, I will be handing out this to you as you leave for your reading pleasure, telling you more about Camp Lutherland. It is a joyful, just incredible Christian experience for all ages, but particularly for our youth, which is so critical. And outside the church office, we also have Camp Blast, which was right there. How handy. Um, if you'd like to send your children, this grandma has four, and I got my eye on those kiddos. They're going to go too. So thank you, and we hope you give this prayer for consideration. Ms. Staff and I are leaving now. We have a lot of announcements today, so sorry about that, but I'm going to have to beg your patience for one more. Um, many of you who are uh, members and have been around for a while have gotten a letter this week. Uh, maybe not everyone has received it yet. We have been, uh, with the council, I have been <clears throat> discussing my need to, um, to do a less than full-time pastoral ministry and, and do more of uh, Christian art and church art on a uh, kind of a professional basis. We've been making moves toward that uh, with my, my family, and um, we sent a letter out about two months ago saying the time was going to come soon when I would be uh, ending my ministry here. The letter that came out this week was more specific. My last Sunday here will be at the end of this month, May 28th. This is not an easy decision. This is not an easy announcement to make. I probably should have stayed in the pulpit so I could pretend I'm hiding behind something. <laughs> but, hmm? Silence. I'm in trouble with Amanda again. <laughs> with still, every week I'm in trouble with Amanda. So. I'm still in trouble with you over, a, what, a month and a half ago, what happened in Easter? Uh, I don't know. So, I just wanted to make you sure everybody knew that. So, may the peace of the Lord be with you always. Uh, Let's share the peace. Please stand. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Please turn and follow the cross as it leads us in during our gathering hymn, Joyful, Joyful, We Adore Thee.
You all can be seated for the sacrament. In holy baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are born children of a fallen humanity. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are reborn children of God and made members of the church, which is the body of Christ. Living with Christ and in the communion of saints, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Anointed with the Holy Spirit, we join in God's mission for the life of the world. called by the Holy Spirit, and trusting in the grace of God, do you desire to have your child baptized in Christ? As you bring your child to receive the gift of baptism, you are, in, you are entrusted with responsibilities. You are to faithfully bring him to the services of God's house and to teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. You are to nurture him in faith and prayer place the Holy Spirit, Holy Scripture in his hands, and provide for his instruction in the Christian faith. All of this so that Caden may know, come to know the God who loves him and may come to respond to Christ with a life of faithfulness to God and service to each other. Do you promise to help your child grow in the Christian faith? <clears throat> and you, the sponsors, do you promise to nurture this child in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit and to help Caden live in the covenant of baptism and in the communion with the church. Yes. And do you, the people of God, promise to support this family in the promises they have made and to pray for Caden Daniel Kleck in his life in Christ? Yes. The Lord be with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Holy God, mighty Lord, gracious Father, we give you thanks for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters and you created heaven and earth. By the gift of water you nourish and sustain us and all living things. Blessed be God now and forever. By the waters of the flood you condemn the wicked and save those whom you had chosen, Noah and his family. You led Israel by the pillar of cloud and fire through the sea, out of slavery into the freedom of the promised land. Blessed be God, now and forever. In the waters of the Jordan, your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Spirit. By the baptism of his own death and resurrection, your beloved son has set us free from the bondage to sin and death, and has opened the way to the joy and freedom of everlasting life. He made water a sign of the kingdom and of cleansing and rebirth. In obedience to his command, we make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God, now and forever. Pour out your Holy Spirit, so that those who are here baptized may be given new life. Wash away the sin of all those who are cleansed by this water, and bring them forth as inheritors of your glorious kingdom. To be given praise and honor and worship through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. I ask you and all who are here gathered to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. You renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and all his empty promises. I do. Do you believe in God the Father? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. You believe in God, the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Kate and Daniel, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. And also with you. God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we give you thanks for freeing your sons and daughters from the power of sin and for raising them up to a new life through this holy sacrament. Pour your Holy Spirit upon Cain and Daniel, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence. Caden Daniel, child of God, you have been sealed with the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Caden, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let us pray. O God, the giver of all life, look with kindness upon the father and mother of Caden. Let them ever rejoice in the gift you have given them. Make them teachers and examples of righteousness for this child. Strengthen them in their own baptism so they may share eternally with their child the salvation you have given them. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please stand. Let us welcome the newly baptized. We welcome you into the Lord's family and into the mission we share. You as a fellow member of the body of Christ, child of the same heavenly father and worker with us in the kingdom of God. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's love to all the world. timing. Kate and I want to introduce you to your new brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family together in God. People of God, this is your new brother, Kate and Daniel. Let's welcome him. Congratulations. You can blow that out.
Let us pray. Almighty God, your Son, Jesus Christ, is the way, the truth, and the life. Give us grace to love one another, to follow in the way of his commandments, and to share his risen life with all the world. For he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You can be seated. I'd ask the kids now to come forward for the children's sermon. <clears throat> oh, come on, it's easy. There we go. Hi. Anyone else want to come up? Oh, not as scary as I look. So, so this is <coughs> uh, this is Professor Erasmus Q. <coughs> Hornswoggle, this Raz. Oh, how you doing? I'm glad that you're here, Raz. Oh, so am I. It's better than a shelf I live on all the time. Yeah. In your office, yes, you do. You do kind of stay there a lot. I live on a shelf. Fine. So, you guys, when when you're at home, do you have your own room? Does anyone share a room? Anyone, are you guys, do you share a room, or do you have some share? Anyone have their own room? You have your own, some people have their own room, some people share a room, right? But there's always a place for you. And when you go and visit grandma or other people, there's a place for you there too, right? I live on a shelf. Yes, you do. And, and, uh, and so there's always somewhere for you to go. Not in my case, fine. And so... Um, and then when you go, anywhere you go, right, there'll always be somewhere for you to, to, to feel at home even when you're away from home and some a special place for you. I live on a shelf. Yes, this is true. So when, when, uh, when we're with God, which is all the time, God has a place for us. So we're always at home no matter where we are because God is with us too. All right, yeah, I don't to you. Live on a shelf. Yes, you live on a shelf. Um, so uh, thank God that you always have a place and you're always at home with God. God always welcomes you. God always has a place for you. Except if you live on a shelf. Okay, thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, we'll see ya. A little angry about the shelf. I, I, I picked that up, yeah. The first reading is from the books of Acts, the book of Acts, the seventh chapter. Filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him, and the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he died. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from 1 Peter. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in scripture. 
See, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. To you then, who believe, he is precious. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the very head of the corner and a stone that makes them stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the place, the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own, but the Father who who dwells in me does this. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works than these, because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. When we're growing up, we have this whole crisis that goes from infancy onward. Who are we? What are we about? Where do we fit in? And this is something that we work at at different stages in our life, and we famously kind of get hung up on this about middle school age. When things start to change, you kind of have to redefine yourself. And then, who are you? What do you dress like? Who do you look like? What name do you go by? Who are your friends? What kind of stuff? 
And then when you get, and just as you think you're kind of getting that settled, then you hit 18, 19, you go away to college or you start working or something else, and then it's all, all over again. What do I believe? What do I accept? What do I want to do? It's all this identity thing, which is fine. But it seems as if our culture has gotten stuck there. As if we don't know who we are. <laughs> to put it um, in the more the, a phrase that has come up in the last couple of years, how do you identify? How do you define who you are? How do you understand who you are? Basically, well, it's like one of those forms that you get that has all the little tick marks on it, little boxes that you put a check by. At the top, there's a line for your name. That's a big one right there. What is your name? What name do you go by? Do you go by your first name? Do you go by your middle name? Do you go by a nickname? Do you hate your name and go by something completely different? What's your last name? Have you changed it when you got married for some other reason? If you get divorced, you change it back. All of this very, very basic level, who I am, who you want to tell people you are. Are you just a first initial and then a name? All of this stuff. The next line is nationality. You write in your nationality, which seems a simple thing, but even for us, it's not. We've been a country for... 247 years, right? Long time, almost 247 years. You ask any American what their nationality is, and the last thing they will tell you is American. We've been a country, when do we get to be a nation? This is amazing. What's your nationality? And we come up with some place generally we've never been to, and there may be sometimes our great-great-grandparents have never been to. I think my last name is Welsh. The last bright to be in Wales was I have no idea. 100, 200 years? Maybe, never. Maybe they made the whole thing up. But still, that's what you tell people what nationality you are. How do you define what your roots are? We just and then, oh, then the hard check marks. The one that we can't get away from right now. It's like the biggest thing for our identity. Where are you politically? Where are you morally? Are you right? Are you left? Are you hard right? Are you hard left? Are you, and I don't even know that they make this anymore, are you moderate? What's your race? Are you this, you're that, are you the other thing? What is your relationship? Are you single? Are you married? Are you in a long-term relationship without being married? Have you, uh, are, are you divorced? Are you something that's not in those categories? Right? Who are you as, as a gender? This used to be, there was like no wiggle room on this. But now, we see this differently. Are you male? Are you female? Are you other? Are you all of the above? Are you none of the above? And that's how we understand ourselves. Then in that form, there's always that dotted line in the bottom, right? That you're not supposed to fill out. This to be filled out for office use only or whatever. Because it's other people, too, who decide who you are. We cannot make ourselves entirely. We might say, this is who I think I am, but it's not necessarily who other people think we are, and we're not really completely in charge of it. What else identifies us rather than our own sense of self? Well, a lot of stuff. Uh, the time that we are born in. If we were born in the year 1100, even if we were born in the year 1900, we'd be very different people. We'd have a very different way of understanding. And it's just a random thing. We have no control when we were born. What your DNA is controls who you are and, and how you look at the world. As simple a thing is as your height literally controls how you see the world. Do you see it from here? Do you see it from here? Do you see it from way up there? How far apart are your eyes? So how much depth do you see? All this kind of stuff. And that's just one little thing. It changes literally how we see the world. No control over that. Where you are born. Growing up in the U.S. is one thing. 
if, if you grew up somewhere else, and we have some people who've grown up in other places, that's another thing. And, and if you grew up in sub-Saharan Africa, if you grew up in, as a native Alaskan, if you grew up in Singapore, all of this would make you a very different person, and you have no control over that. And how people perceive you really does change who you are, how you understand yourself. I'm a popular person. I must be charming, or I must be ugly, or there must be something about me that just chases people away. This We don't get this from ourselves. We're taught this from other people. We don't make ourselves. Really, now this is silly, but, but if you made yourselves, where would you stand when you were doing that? If you made yourselves, how would you do your hands? I mean, that's, that's ridiculous, but still, the, the point is there. You don't make yourself. The hand thing, I'm not just being silly on it. You know this one, the, the hand coming out from the Sistine Chapel, right? There's this big, big famous thing that shows up all the time. There's the hand of God coming down, and it has this sort of twisty, powerful, clenchy action going on, right? And it's, it's definitely come on, and pointing down and then pointing up the other way, more tentative, and look at the picture. It's, it's definitely more like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, is, is Adam. God forms us. God changes who we are. God very specifically changed who Caden was about 15 minutes ago. Our baptism changes who we are. The death of Jesus changes who we are, not just what we believe. It really makes a difference in our real identity. Our actual us-ness is changed by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When we baptized Caden, I don't know if you guys caught this. We do this all the time. We baptize. We said, now we're going to be um, baptizing uh, Caden Daniel Cluck. And when we do the baptism, do you notice we only did the first two names? Caden Daniel. Because his name, his identity has changed. He is now Caden, Daniel, son of God. Also son of his parents, but son of God. It becomes a whole different thing. So who are you? Actually, I found out something this week about who you are that you might be surprised by. I sure was. You're a minority, but you may not think how much of a minority you are. I've, the percentage of, a, of people in the United States who are in a worship service every weekend, say, right? Uh, Muslims on Friday, Jews on, on uh, Saturday uh, or Friday, Christians generally on Sunday, all of those put Hindu temples, whatever, who attend worship regularly or, or on any particular Sunday, not everyone who does it, but on any Sunday, it is 9% of the population. You knew you were in a small group. Did you know it was that small? That blew me away. 9% on any given weekend. That's amazing. That's who you are. Who are you? You're people who are stuck in your sin and you know it. You're people who are in need of help and need of God's mercy, and you know that too. You're people who cannot save yourselves. You cannot make yourself perfect any more than you can make your own bodies, any more than you can bring your own DNA. We are people who live by God's grace alone, and we know that too. It's not up to us. We were made by grace, we live by grace, we die and we rise by grace. And since you are a minority. You are among the 9% of the population who's somewhere this weekend giving praise to something other than them. You're conspicuous. You stand out. It used to be, this was the thing you did to blend in. You'd stand out if you didn't go to church. This was kind of like the cultural expectation. It's now the counterculture. You stand out, and when you do, eyes are on you. Did you know this? Did you think about this? 
People are looking, if they know that you do this kind of thing, what difference does it make in your life? So when you do, uh, when you talk to people, when you talk about people, when you do things, people are going to say, what does that Christian identity, that religious identity, do? If you're angry, if you're mean, if you're judging, it does not help. We are... It says in the scripture, the priesthood of believers. Luther talks about, too, the the priesthood of the baptized. Now Caden is part of this. Not a priest of the baptized, part of the priesthood. It's what we're all doing together. Now you think, oh, I'm not really doing that. I don't have a a collar and all that kind of stuff. doesn't matter. What you are in, a priest is a middle person, right? Largely why... Lutherans don't use the word so much, right? Very rarely will we use that word. A priest is someone who is in between. You have to get to God, you have to go through the priest. But also, that's someone who represents God to the world, and this is you. And who represents the world to God, and this is you. This is why you are part of that priesthood. You are also part of the body of Christ. You are also... the a living stone, which is a weird analogy. But the church isn't a building. The church isn't an institution. It's not a constitutional thing. It's not just a big (coughs) political, ethical force that has come through time. It is what puts it together is you. You're the thing that there are the literal building blocks. No matter who the world says you are. And no matter really who you understand yourself to be, never forget what God has made you to be in Christ. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, so that you can tell the mighty acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Amen.
united in the hope and joy of the resurrection. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Please kneel as you are able. God of life, strengthen your church to proclaim your gospel even in difficult times. As we remember Stephen, we give thanks for all those who minister. Bless all pastors, deacons, associates in ministry, directors of music, and strengthen them for their bridge-building ministry between church and the world. Hear us, O God. Creating God, you show your steadfast love through mighty waters, towering mountains, verdant fields, and arid deserts. Protect the Earth's diverse habitat from the forces of pollution, erosion, extinction, global warming, and our own neglect. Hear us, O oh God. Mighty God, your spirit guides us into all truth. Give wisdom to world and local leaders and organizations as they begin, build, or renew relationships. Strengthen leaders and aid organizations in areas needing to be rebuilt following conflict, unrest, or natural disaster. Hear us, O oh God. Loving God, you make your home among us. Abide with refugees, those experiencing homelessness, those fleeing war and poverty, and all those who question if there is a home in your heart. We pray for all the sick, and we pray, dear God, yet another week of those victims of gun violence. Help us not to become jaded to the horrific problem and help us find answers. Hear us, O oh God. Assuring God, you accompany your people amid uncertainty and change. Uphold people in this community who have recently moved, who are changing jobs or schools or retiring and are going through transitions of any kind, lead this congregation forward in the changes that it has in the future. Oh God, your mercy is great. Renewing God, you gather the saints at your heavenly banquet. We give you thanks for the care shown us by those who have gone before us. Grant confidence and comfort for all awaiting the place you have prepared. Hear us, O oh God. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God, through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.
God does many things through our offerings. This week we give thanks for your gifts, which help us to celebrate the sacraments of holy baptism and holy communion that offer us God's promises of life and salvation. Please stand. Almighty and merciful God, you are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and peace and receiving the forgiveness of sin may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints 
To you, O oh God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, now and forever. Amen. 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 Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for just a moment. For those who are receiving Holy Communion at home, please take your bread. This is the body of Christ given for you. And now your cup. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. For those who are receiving in our gathering today, we will commune the choir first. And after that, we invite all to come forward by the side aisles. You'll see that there are trays of little cups uh, at the head of the aisles. Please bring a cup with you. We fill in around the altar rail. You can stand or kneel as you are able. We will place in your hand the bread, and then you may consume that, and the assisting minister will pour wine into your cup. You may consume that and then return to your seat by the center aisle. There's bins at the head of the aisle uh, for your empty cups. We also have available uh, gluten-free host and grape juice if you need that um, instead of the bread and wine. Again, all are welcome. Uh, this is God's gift to us. And you are welcome to receive today. The gifts are ready. Come and receive. I should add that uh, children who do not receive yet, or if you prefer, um, you may come forward for a blessing.
blood of Christ shed for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. 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 The body of Christ given for you.
the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Life-giving God, in the mystery of Christ's resurrection, you send light to conquer darkness, water to give new life, and the bread of life to nourish your people. Send us forth as witnesses to your son's resurrection, that we may show your glory to all the world. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, share the good news that Christ is risen.